Thank you, Ben. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the uh, last lecture. It's a great honour for me to be able to introduce Ikeda Sensei for this. Uh, I was once a student of his many, 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 many years ago, um, and he left a great impression on me as a student. I remembered him for how great a teacher he was. I would send him a New Year's card every year, and he would send it back with corrections. <laughs> So he left a great impression on me as a student, more so than any of the other lecturers I had, and I had lots of brilliant lecturers as a student. Um, and I came back to the ANU and uh, became a colleague of Ikeda Sensei and realised his brilliance from a different perspective. I taught some courses together with him and understood in a more intellectual way how great a teacher he was. I could see what he was doing when I was young and naive and wearing shorts and bare feet. I just appreciated learning, but I could see what he was doing as a lecturer. And sometimes I wished to, wanted to shake the students and say, you guys don't understand how good he is. You really don't, um, because he's an excellent, excellent teacher. And it's my great pleasure to introduce him. So here we are, Ikeda Sensei for the last lecture of 2016. Your Excellency, uh, Ambassador of Japan, Mr. Asumi Okusaka, and distinguished guests, uh, Pro Vice Chancellor uh, Richard Baker, and ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to be here. I was humbled, scared, with lots of trepidation and concern and anxiety and apprehension and insomnia and everything else. <laughs> but, and when I um, had to come up with the uh, lecture theme or topic. I was uh, debating whether I should give a real sort of lecture in my own uh, field of research, which is comparative education, which I was trained in the States, or should I teach elementary Japanese to everyone who's coming along, <laughs> or should I uh, give some lectures on uh, methodology and how to teach Japanese to those non-Japanese teachers. But in the end, I thought, uh, no, that's not my cup of tea, um, or cup of green tea, I suppose. <laughs> so I decided I should come up with this, the geta and the thong, a personal account of Australia-Japan relations from the 70s. Why 70s? Because that's the time that I started my undergraduate studies at the ANU, before all of you are not born. So. But today's talk is, as I said before, uh, not so much as a lecture, but um, it's kind of a personal account of what I have been doing in Australia for uh, such a long time, since the uh, beginning of the 70s. 70s meaning 1970s, not 1870s. <laughs> um, so I'll just uh, briefly talk about past and then present and then future. The past, I'll talk about how lucky I was as a person in this lucky country. As some of you may recall, that Donald Horne wrote a book called Lucky Country. And in that, he said that uh, Australia is very lucky, sitting on lots of mineral resources and agricultural products, and Australians do not need to work, but they can live comfortably. And then I think he was using this lucky country as a kind of cynical way, but this uh, coinage of lucky country was taken as describing Australia as very lucky country in the world in many senses. And I came to this university in, back in 1970 um, as one of the luckiest, perhaps, uh, students from Japan because um, I was told afterwards, after I came here and then perhaps into second or third months of my study at the ANU, that I was the first degree-seeking Japanese national student here at the ANU. And I was a bit surprised because there were quite a few 
postgraduate students at that time, but none who is doing a degree program at the ANU. So I'd like to just dwell on a little bit about my personal uh, life in the 70s, reflecting the Austria-Japan relations at that time, and then gradually coming on to the closer time, and then my personal thoughts on the future of Australian and Japanese uh, relations, and also young people in both countries. And this is purely my personal account, and do not quote in your uh, term paper or semester paper, and so on. Now, um, as some of you may recognize the Vietnam War as one of the uh, very uh, controversial uh, topic in the 70s. It started in the 60s, of course, but uh, in the 60s, uh, lots of uh, student movements were at its height. And uh, I was at a university in Japan, in Tokyo, in Japan, for two years in the late 60s. But uh, my university, uh, which was Keio Gijuku, uh, was no exception. Uh, students uh, had a, a general assembly or some meeting, and they decided to go on strike. So uh, one month or two months after the uh, first semester started, the university went on strike, and no class is nothing. So um, there were two ways to spend your free time. One is to get involved with those student movements, and then lots of they're called teach-ins, so private, sort of, uh, privately uh, organized uh, seminar type of things. And also, uh, there's another way that they call it in Japanese, non-poli. Uh, coming from English word non-political, meaning not committing anything to any uh, political movement and so on. So they are the ones who did uh, lots of uh, volunteering and uh, other uh, sort of precursor of uh, NPOs and NGOs these days, but in those days there were none of those. And I chose the latter and I joined the uh, Japanese uh, Junior Red Cross, and then uh, I, cho I also chose, I cho chose um, uh, Japan Youth Hostels Association to organize lots of uh, uh, interesting uh, projects with uh, hostelers from all over the world and so on. But after two years, I was sick of doing something other than what I was supposed to do uh, studying at the university. And I was lucky, it so happened that my father, who was working for a private company in Japan, was posted to Sydney, Australia. So he asked me if I was interested in coming to Australia. And naturally I said, yes, if you pay for me. <laughs> and in 1969, um, I decided to move from Japan to Australia. But of course, you know, I had to uh, overcome the first hurdle, English. I wasn't an English student or anything uh, close to English because uh, I must confess that my high school uh, academic record, English grade was three out of five. So five is the highest and one is the lowest and I was always three, 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 three and so on. So my English wasn't that hot. So I had to take uh, the English test at the uh, Australian Embassy in Tokyo. You can't believe it now because there's so much, so many other uh, testing uh, facilities available now. IELTS, uh, TOEIC, uh, TOEFL, and something else. But I was astonished that I had to take an English test at the Embassy of um, uh, Australian Embassy in Tokyo. And there, I was again pretty lucky to meet a young aspiring Australian diplomat called Trevor Wilson, who uh, sent his uh, absence uh, regards to everyone. But uh, I owe a lot to him because he was the one who, with my uh, lack of English and everything else, who thought, hmm, here's an interesting Japanese guy who is interested in Australia. He may 
do something about Australia in the future. So this is the talk that I had with Tova after I came to Australia. And I asked him, why did I pass the English exam? Because my speaking and listening comprehension were zilch, you know, almost nil. <laughs> and he said, well, your speaking and listening comprehension were uh, non-existent, to put it mildly. But your composition and grammar and reading comprehension were quite solid. And uh, there were other students who took the same examination with me who had been to either in the States or in England somewhere, so uh, studying abroad when they were high school and then they took the test, and then they were speaking and listening comprehension were excellent. And I couldn't keep up with them. They were talking in English at lunchtime and so on. I was sort of distanced you know, from them. But uh, Trevor told me that all of them were sent to uh, English school before they were admitted to the universities. So I said again, that, no, that's ridiculous because their English seemed to be very good. But he said, no, their speaking and listening was okay, but they were not able to write uh, meaningful sentences, their comprehension was awful, and their grammar was non-existent. So, um, I was admitted to both ANU and Sydney. But if I went to uh, Sydney University, I would have commuted from my parents' place, which wouldn't be good for my English, so I decided to come to the ANU without knowing what kind of city Canberra uh, was and how big or how small or whatever. There's no uh, information about Canberra at that time, but I decided to come to the ANU, which, of course, I think I made the right decision. And in the 70s, um, it was still at the time that the Vietnam War was going on, and uh, quite a few of my friends were worried about being conscripted, and uh, lots of demonstrations against Vietnam War and so on, but not as violent as students in other countries. So uh, we were able to uh, carry on our day-to-day -day studies and the seminars and whatnot. And I was also lucky that through my supervisor at Keio University, Professor Tadao Kuribayashi, who did his PhD in Australian uh, space law in law faculty. Uh, he did his PhD with such distinguished, dis distinguished uh, scholars as uh, Emeritus Professor Arthur Stockwin of ANU and uh, Oxford, and Emeritus uh, Professor Peter Drysdale at the ANU, and Dr. John Keja, who is here with us, um, and I, um, I call him Onshi in Japanese, meaning someone whom I indebted to the bone. So uh, without his uh, assistance, I wouldn't have been standing here this year. And between 1970 to 1975, I had a tremendous uh, university life. And here's one shot that uh, Dr. Peter Hendricks uh, supplied to me. This was the uh, uh, tutorial class on the lawn in the sort of uh, uh, law faculty uh, quadrangle. And uh, you can, perhaps the people in the back can't see it clearly, but the uh, one on the left is Dr. Peter Hendricks with long hair, and you can't tell much, but uh, he's wearing shorts. He was wearing shorts all year round. You know. <laughs> Summer, spring, autumn, winter, doesn't matter. He was wearing shorts with no thongs, so bare feet and so on. And maybe you, ca you can't recognize me. Um, I'm uh, sitting here. This is me with uh, black hair and everything. <laughs> <laughs> and strangely enough that um, I don't particularly remember those students in the last, say, three, five years. And if I see them, then I recognize faces and then uh, maybe uh, last name, but not first name and so on. But I remember all these students 
both first names and surnames. We can just tell them. So it's amazing. Okay. So um, under Gough Whitlam's uh, Labour government came in at uh, the end of uh, 72. So from 1973, as you recall, free education started at the university level in Australia. So I was one of those uh, uh, students uh, who benefited from the free education in the 70s. And I was in one of the student residences, uh, Garan Hall, and uh, I uh, enjoyed uh, immensely, mainly because uh, when I was in Japan, as you may imagine, that everyone is doing more or less the same thing. Uh, small things like uh, in Japan at school, they change their uniforms uh, according to the calendar. It doesn't matter what the temperature is, it doesn't matter what the weather is, but from the first day of June, everyone has to wear a summer school uniform. And then when uh, winter comes, then even if it's too warm or uh, weather is good, but everyone has to wear winter school uniforms and so on. But when I came here, it's so free, um, so uh, diversified in attiring any kinds of uh, clothes. So some of them are uh, wearing shorts and sh uh, t-shirts, but some are wearing long sleeves with jumper and then long trousers and so on. So it's up to each individual and I found it very interesting. And also uh, from coming from a kind of uh, single ethnic group society, the Australian society even in the 70s, was amazing, that uh, mixture of Caucasians and Asians and uh, African people and some South Americans and a few uh, from uh, uh, Middle East and so on. And so, so many different uh, people, different backgrounds, different languages, different cultural backgrounds and so on, were got together and then studying uh, in their own way but uh, we did a lot of things together, and that was amazing to me. And amongst these uh, friends, then I made uh, lifelong friends, uh, like uh, Ross Westcott and uh, Edie Young, who are here with me, and I'm grateful that they came here to see me and listen to what I am saying here. And uh, as um, anti-Vietnam War demonstrations were getting fierce and so on, then I got uh, quite a few advice from uh, senior students or postgraduate students that I should not be involved as an international student because uh, if I just make some trouble, then my visa will be uh, terminated and then I have to go back home and so on. So there were quite a few who are not against this uh, uh, anti-Vietnam War demonstrations and so on, but the way they approach these uh, issues, there are so many different ways to appeal to politicians and other uh, policy makers and so on. And I learned quite a lot from a senior students and postgraduate students as well. And believe it or not, in the early 70s, uh, on Anzac Day, when I was going to see uh, Anzac Parade as a kind of a memorial thing, but I was uh, told again from uh, senior students and postgraduate students that, well, if you're a Japanese, uh, don't go to the Anzac Day Parade because you may be abused or you may be thrown a stone or egg or something like that. So uh, I... Uh, he did the uh, advice and then I didn't go, unfortunately, but uh, later on when the situation uh, became better, then I started uh, taking part in Anzac Day Parade and so on. Um, although I was uh, relying on my parents' uh, uh, stipend, I tried to do part-time jobs as much as possible to help my uh, uh, accommodation fees and so on. But of course the tuition fees, as I said, I mentioned uh, were free, so I didn't have to worry about it. That was a great help. And um, I did lots of uh, tour guides 
for Japanese tourists who came to Canberra to have a look at Canberra and going back to Sydney or Melbourne and so on. And I got to know quite a few friends outside of the university in the touring industry and so on. And by chance, I met a person, a gentleman called uh, Graham Freudenberg, who was uh, an advisor, political advisor to Gough Whitlam, the Labour government uh, uh, prime minister. So through him, I was given a few opportunities to do an, an interpreting for Gough Whitlam at Parliament House and some other places and so on. And I was amazed by Gough Whitlam's remarkable uh, memory that the second time I met him after possibly six months after my first job with him, he remembered my name and I was impressed. And I uh, enjoyed my uh, sport activities at the ANU. Um, believe it or not, and I'm not that tall, but I was a basketball player uh, in Japan. So naturally when I came out here, I joined the ANU basketball club and I joined the inter-varsity teams and so on. Then, uh, luckily, in 1973, I was chosen as one of the combined universities team. So I was uh, uh, awarded a Blues Award, Sporting Award, at the ANU in 1973. And um, I was chosen to a team called ACT Team. There was no name. It was uh, before NBL, National Basketball League, came into being. So I joined the team and then enjoyed uh, basketball. And I was uh, recommended to uh, Australian University at Squad for Rome 1975. But because you have to be an Australian citizen, and I didn't have a citizenship, so I had to turn it down. But those are, are good sort of memories uh, of the 70s. Then, when I finished uh, my honours year in 1975, and I was debating whether to go back to Japan or seek uh, postgraduate studies or something else, then um, Professor Antonio Alfonso, of the head of the Department of Japanese at that time, approached me and asked me if I could be a tutor in Japanese in 76. And 76, as you may no is the year that Nara Treaty, so-called Nara Treaty, the Nippon-Australia Relations Agreement, or Basic Treaty of Friendship and Cooperation between Australia and Japan. So this was the year that Australia and Japan were coming closer, not only just economic terms, but also cultural and political and other spheres. And so 76, I was offered a job, and then I turned it down first because I had no experience whatsoever, and I didn't do linguistics, so I didn't do uh, teaching Japanese methodology and, or anything like that. So I wasn't confident and I wasn't uh, interested, perhaps. But Professor Alfonso insisted that we need someone like you, and I said, uh, like myself, what? Then he said, the uh, most important quality to be a teacher is to understand students' mind, students' interests, students' um, hobbies and other things. So, for example, what kind of songs they are interested in now, what kind of movies they tend to go and see, what kind of books they read, what kind of uh, topics they talk about amongst themselves and so on. Um, I think Professor Alfonso heard from some students of Japanese in those days that um, I was living in Garen Hall and then I was mixing with Australians. So I know kind of a culture, a student's culture in those days. And also I was sort of a hosting uh, kind of Japanese uh, speaking salon type of thing that uh, say, every Tuesday night uh, from 8 to 10, please come to my room and then we can chat in Japanese. Or if you have questions, you can come and ask me kind of thing. So Professor Alfonso must have heard and then uh, recommended that uh, I start uh, this uh, teaching Japanese without knowing anything. So uh, on the job training, I started and uh, I sort of managed to uh, keep up. But 
soon after, perhaps uh, only three, four weeks after I started, I realized that teaching language is not just teaching language, but uh, teaching culture, way of thinking, uh, philosophy, and all sorts of things that behind languages that you need to convey. So through yourself, you know, through the person, uh, students learn something, not just the simply grammar or pronunciation or uh, sentence patterns of a certain language, but also you teach enormous amount of uh, other things behind language. And then I, when I discovered that, I thought, oh, this is very interesting, then I may pursue this avenue for a while. So I stayed on and then uh, started doing uh, an evening called Japanese Evening with uh, then uh, lecturer of uh, Japanese literature, Roger Paulus, who later became a playwright and also he was a uh, uh, professor at the Tokyo University of In uh, Institute, Tokyo Institute of uh, Industrial Studies and so on. And uh, we started Japanese Evening with modern uh, Japanese plays in the hope that students will learn more sort of live language situations and live conversation and communication and so on, apart from uh, textbooks and so on. And then I initiated the so-called Japanese Weekend uh, immersion uh, intensive uh, camp, uh, either in the mountains or in, on campus, uh, Kaiolo campus and so on. And because I was lucky because I learned this uh, system of uh, immersion program through uh, Russian weekend. Uh, Russian was one of my uh, majors in undergraduate studies and in Russian department then, unfortunately it's folded now, uh, did this uh, Russian weekend and I thought it was a, a brilliant idea to spend a weekend together and uh, walking together in Russian and cooking together in Russian and cleaning up together in Russian and dreaming in Russian and so on. So I thought, oh, okay, well, we should uh, adopt this to Japanese and then uh, starting Japanese weekend, which uh, now students, Japan club students are carrying on. So I'm very pleased with this tradition. Okay. But um, when I was uh, teaching for four or five years, then I felt that I did not uh, deposit anything into my bank account, but I was withdrawing all the time. So my bank account was getting less and less, and um, I feel that my brain's getting less and less resources and so on. So I decided to do a postgraduate studies, uh, firstly within Australia, but unfortunately in those days, nowadays they do, but in those days there were no comparative education uh, that I was interested in, uh, the area that I was interested in. So I looked for some opportunities in the United States and uh, I found a few and I applied and I got a few. So I decided to go to uh, uh, State University of New York at Buffalo and uh, the place that I didn't uh, study beforehand again, just like I, before I came to Canberra, I didn't know anything about Canberra. But Buffalo, I had no idea, and I didn't know. The place was one of the coldest cities in the United States. Yeah. But uh, if I talk about this, uh, my sojourn in, uh, in the United States, then that's getting too long, so I just cut it. And uh, I'll talk about when I came back from the United States. So in 1988, I finally came back to the ANU uh, with a position vacant, so I applied and I got it. And uh, when I came back, uh, Professor Drew Gerstel, uh, who was an expert on uh, puppet theatre, Ningyo Joruri, started Kabuki at the ANU uh, in the 80s. And to this date, uh, when I pressed him, asked him a few times that when did you actually start Kabuki at the ANU? He always answered, no, I don't remember. So I asked him, you know, didn't you make any programs or flyers or something that shows you, know, uh, you started Kabuki from when? And he said, I just uh, checked them away and no, 
records whatsoever. So uh, although the Kabuki Club is boasting that it's 39th and 40th anniversary next year, it's actually dubious. <laughs> so uh, it is certain that it started in the 80s, but I don't know exactly when. But, um, In 1992, uh, when the Ministry of Education and Science uh, decided to let national universities uh, start exchanging uh, students from uh, overseas or international students. So before then, national universities were not allowed to do an exchange because of uh, tuition fee and all these things. But 92, it opened up. So. Uh, Drew Gerstow and myself thought, oh, this is a good opportunity, so we started to uh, set up an exchange program with 12 universities to start with. Uh, we didn't uh, uh, sort of test two or three universities, but in instead, uh, between us, Drew Gerstow and myself, we had some close friends here and there in Japan, so we decided to start this program with 12 universities from the beginning, and which was a tremendous success. and. Uh, I would say about 20 to 25 students every year in the 90s, they went to Japan and lesser number of students came to ANU from Japan, but there was a tremendous uh, program, which is kind of dwindling and uh, withering at the moment, so um, it's a shame, but I hope that it will be revived soon. And I was lucky again in <coughs> that same year, 1992, I was given the uh, inaugural Vice Chancellor's Award uh, in uh, Excellence in Language Teaching. So I was given that simply because that was the first year, inaugural year, and no one hardly knew about it, and hardly anyone was nominated, and then luckily my students knew about it, so I was nominated and I got it. So <laughs> ever since I haven't been given, <laughs> no, no, that's not true, ever since I I have been nominated, nominated almost every year, but I turn it down because once I got it, then that's it. I don't have to prove anything. So I let, <laughs> I let everyone else to, uh, no, those deserve colleagues, uh, deserving co colleagues should get that uh, award. And I started uh, language exchange amongst the uh, uh, international students from Japan with our own students. And then I started a career forum and so on. And also, when the ANU started secondary college, meaning years 11 and 12 students uh, come to the ANU and then uh, do uh, courses with the ANU, uh, teachers are from uh, colleges, but uh, students can use all the facilities at the ANU, and they are given a sort of pre-selection uh, admission and so on, and it's still continuing since uh, it started in 2007, it's still continuing, and it's a very uh, strong program, but it's sort of facing a uh, financial problem at the moment, and I hope it will continue uh, for many years to come. And also, I started the second-hand Japanese book sale uh, back in 2011, uh, 2012, sorry, uh, after the uh, 2011 uh, earthquake and tsunami. So that's been sort of uh, quite a popular uh, book sale uh, every year, or annual sort of book sale uh, since then. The money goes to the Austria Japan Society in ACT, uh, who, uh, which invites uh, Chugakusei and Kokose high school and college students in Japan to Canberra for a brief respite in uh, spending, say, a couple of weeks uh, in Canberra. So we contribute uh, to that uh, program. Uh, for this old sale, uh, proceed, uh, proceeds go to this program. So. And uh, perhaps I should just mention a little bit about Kabuki. Um, a lot of people ask me, uh, is your uh, academic expertise in this area, you know, Kabuki or other uh, traditional sort of performing arts? Simply, no. I had no experience whatsoever to study uh, those traditional uh, performing arts, and no, I was a, an avid, keen fan to go and see kabuki every week in Japan and so on. No, I wasn't. It's just a whim that I thought um, how a tradition or traditional 
performing art is accepted in a different culture, different environment, and different people. And I just wanted to uh, see how far students can go. And that they have gone very far. Um, amazingly, students took this kabuki as a fun event. And so within a Japan uh, students, uh, ANU Japan Club, there's a, an independent uh, kabuki club called Zak Kabuki. And every year we perform uh, two nights in September. And uh, back in 1999, we visited Japan. Four years after the great uh, Hanshin Awaji earthquake uh, in the Kansai area, we visited Nara and Kobe and performed uh, to those who were affected uh, to some extent. So this time, uh, this year in September, last month, we did a tour of uh, Higashi Nihon, uh, East Japan, the areas where uh, they were heavily, uh, severely affected by earthquake and uh, tsunami. Uh, because when we started talking about going to Japan this year, at the beginning of this year, in February, uh, the beginning of first semester, when we, we were discussing, we were asking amongst ourselves, where should we go? Then, uh, un unanimously, everyone said we'd like to go to Tohoku, to talk to people there and then to show that we have not forgotten those people and then we'd like to know their prospect <coughs> and their hope and ideas and so on nowadays. So we decided to go to Tohoku and then we toured around two weeks in September last month and performed in Akita, Kesennuma and Ishinomaki. And Akita was not affected by earthquake and tsunami heavily, but uh, there was there's a university in Akita with whom uh, we have an exchange agreement. So we went there. So I just I want to share this uh, fun part very quickly with this uh, slides. Oops, sorry. Oh. Uh, this was the Kabuki Club, uh, Canberra uh, and Japan tour. Uh, this is the uh, Canberra airport before we depart. And that's uh, sort of a scene from uh, Akita performance. And amazingly, uh, we did not bring our own palanquin, this kago, because it's too heavy to carry. So we asked the uh, Akita International University if there's any chance of hiring kago from somewhere, please do. Then the university went out of its way and approached a very old samurai family in Kakunodate and borrow this palanquin of 250 years old, <laughs> authentic palanquin. And we were amazed and we were awed and then we didn't want to touch, but... <laughs> <laughs> so we did not put anyone inside, just in case it's broken, then we might have to cover $100 million or something. <laughs> uh, so we borrowed this and other things and there was a tremendous success. And then this horse uh, costume, also we borrowed it from a professional, uh, professional um, uh, performing group called Warabiza in Akita. So those of you who saw our performance in Canberra in September, totally different horse from this one. <laughs> so if this is a thoroughbred, then our horse in Canberra was an uh, uh, agricultural sort of... Uh, <laughs> dilapidated old horse. Yeah. This is just a uh, uh, shot after the uh, rehearsal. And this is uh, uh, backstage. Oh, sorry, no, uh, this was the uh, sort of after, after performance party at the uh, Akita International University. And then Akita Station heading towards uh, Kesennuma. Then this is the house which was affected by the uh, earthquake and tsunami. And we were amazed that the owner of this house used to be a part-time tutor in Japanese at the Australian National University in the 90s. And I knew she went back to Tohoku area, but I didn't remember she was from Kesennuma, the city that I, we visited. 
and she, where she was living three minutes walk from the uh, Japanese accommodation hotel in uh, Ryokan. So I was astounded to see her there and she was kindly showed her uh, dilapidated, uh, affected house. And there was a uh, shot after the performance too. And then during the uh, tour, we were uh, entertained by the uh, Japanese drum and then also we practiced a little bit of drum as well. Then we were uh, on the uh, oyster farm, oyster farming uh, tour. Uh, so these people, the young people are there uh, trying to revive their famous oyster farms and so on. So we had a look at the uh, first hand uh, recovery stage. And that's just a shot. Uh, this student was very popular wherever he went. So he, he was always with the uh, young ladies. <laughs> and this is the hotel, uh, Japanese style ryokan, we stayed. But the, apparently the tsunami uh, came over the, uh, where, where our balcony is, and then over the top, and then only the third floor was uh, remained. So they uh, re uh, renovated and then reconstructed the first and second floors, but they were totally uh, destroyed. And then that's a big sign in Ishinomaki, Ganbaro Ishinomaki. Right? And then we had a chance to uh, mingle with uh, Ishinomaki Senshu Daigaku uh, University students to exchange our views and talking about the uh, uh, disaster and the disaster prevention and so on. And then this was the after uh, performance shot in Ishinomaki. And the party. And then uh, some of us went to see a real authentic kabuki in Kabukiza in Tokyo. So that's the sort of ticket, uh, you know, the very cheap ticket up on the top floor. <laughs> so you don't have to spend thousands of dollars, but very cheap. Then that's the, uh, in front of the Kabuki Theatre with myself and the producer of this year, Erin Makala. And then, of course, there's a party afterwards. And then those who were uh, students at the ANU, uh, see the one on the right is uh, Pat Komalabon, who is studying at the University of Tokyo now, and a few other senpai who did kabuki last year, year before, and so on, came along, and we had a wonderful time. Uh, this is a bit uh, out of order, but the uh, Ishinomaki Information Center, and that's again this uh, popular character here. <laughs> And this was uh, a dressing room in Ishinomaki as well. And then uh, this was uh, after performance. Uh, those of you who came and see this year's Kabuki, we, for the first time we provided uh, subtitles for all the lines and everything. So that was the afterwards. So those are just shots from this Kabuki. Um, many people ask me why I do uh, direct kabuki every year. A few reasons, but the most, one, most uh, important one is that uh, I'd like to, as I said, create um, tradition, uh, but not a real tradition in Japan, but tradition here, uh, kind of Australianized kabuki tradition here. And with this uh, fake history of 40 odd years of kabuki, <laughs> Um, it's gradually coming now. Uh, namely, it's not just a, a kabuki style performance, but we put in some uh, pop music with uh, modern dance and some jokes and um, some uh, funny actions and so on, which are not allowed to do in kabuki perhaps. So uh, we are kind of creating a new tradition here, which I would like students to carry on. Secondly, um, in Japan, um, there's a very sort of strong uh, bond amongst the club members to do everything together. And um, they become very close and then they become sort of lifelong friends and so on. But here, um, 
in a good way, in a good sense and bad sense, that Australia doesn't have that sort of culture, and I'd like students to experience that sort of culture. So having joined in Kabuki Club and doing rehearsals together and some other things together, then they become very close and then they uh, bond it. And then um, they not only talk about Kabuki, but they also talk about something else, future of Australia, future of Japan and so on. So I think it's a good thing to keep this uh, momentum and activity going. So those are the, uh, oh, there are many other reasons, but there are these basic reasons that I keep doing this. And the 40th anniversary of, the fake 40th anniversary of the Japanese evening is a, a big celebration next year. And the former dean of the College of Asia and the Pacific promised that it will be a wonderful 40th anniversary of Kabuki. So I hope it will be materialized in 2017. But one of the uh, ideas is that we have visited Japan to perform in Japan, but we have not performed in other cities in Australia. So we might do a tour in Australia, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, and so on next year. So those of you who are interested, please join us and have fun together next year. Okay, um, the time is suppressing, so I... Oops, sorry. I have to go back. Sumimasen. <laughs> Oh, it doesn't go back. <laughs> so that means a hint that I should finish here. <laughs> so I was going to talk about my current situation, but many of you are aware, so I don't dwell on. But uh, one thing I can say clearly is that I don't know what I'll be doing next year. Um, so uh, it's very annoying that I, don't, I can't so plan ahead, but simply that I do not know what is going to happen to me next year. Uh, if I can stay on, then I'd like to stay on. But if I can't, then um, I'm uh, starting to look at the uh, uh, job ad in the Camera Times or something like that. <laughs> but future, uh, just very briefly, future, I'd like to say, uh, two, uh, to, to say two things. That one, Japan is known to be an aging society. So many old generation, older generation people, and not many young people. Australia is not the opposite, but not bad, as bad as uh, Japan yet. And Japan is a kind of mono-ethnic group society, and Australia is a multi-ethnic, multilingual, and multicultural society. So we are in a sort of position of complementing each other. And those of you who visit Japan uh, would know that the Japanese uh, politeness and kindness and all these uh, most Australian tourists say they are impressed. Uh, Japanese who come to Australia say that openness and uh, diversified culture, uh, language and everything else is amazing and they enjoy the atmosphere here. So I may be very optimistic, but if young Australians and young Japanese get together and plan something together and in trying to solve as many issues as possible in this area of the South Pacific and Asia, for that matter, perhaps Pacific Rim areas, so that we can lead the whole world, that so many different differences between the two countries, Australia and Japan, but we understand each other quite well, and we respect each other, we know the differences, but we do things together, then it's not one plus one is two, but maybe one plus one is 1 1.5 or maybe three. So um, I would like, especially you know, students, young people, that uh, Australians and Japanese cooperate and then uh, try to do things together. And if we do together, then some countries uh, which are kind of suspicious or dubious about our intentions. If, say, for example, Japan does something by itself and then try to help, they, some countries might feel that, oh, Japan's trying to do something behind or something. But if Australia is doing that with Japan, then they might think, oh, okay, Australia is supporting and then doing things, then that's fine. Likewise, 
if Australia does something by itself, then by herself, then uh, some country might uh, politely reject. But if Japan's uh, in that, and then together, Australia and Japan trying to help those countries, they might listen. So I do hope young people in those two countries will unite together and try to project some remarkable things together in the next uh, five, ten years or beyond. And I, I'm sure that you will be able to do that. And in a way, again, in Japan, it's a kind of experimental stage of aging society. If Japan can solve this aging problems, then that will uh, be uh, beneficial for many countries, many other countries which are sort of uh, keeping up with Japan. And also Australia, it's uh, multi-cultural, multi-ethnic, and multi-lingual uh, societies, and which is different from, say, for example, the United States. The basic principle, to me, I was in the States for seven years, so I felt the United States policy is a kind of melting pot policy. Anyone who comes to the United States, they are expected to become Americans. But here in Australia, the policy is salad bowl. So in salad bowl, you can recognize, oh, here's lettuce, here's carrot, here's cucumber, oops, <laughs> here's, uh, this is a microphone. Uh, <laughs> as uh, something else. But each has its own place and each is distinct. But as a whole, you can enjoy salad. So Australia is such a, such a society. And it is, it, to me, doing an experiment that no other countries are doing at the moment. So in that sense, I would say Australia is far ahead of other countries to experiment this harmonious, harmonious multicultural, multi-ethnic, and multilingual society. So I hope Australian, Australian young people and in Japanese young people, you uh, hold a torch high, and then if you can't do it, then pass it on to the next generation, and ge next generation, and so on. And in the end, perhaps from this area, Pacific and Asia, uh, between Australia and Japan, can influence the whole world in our own way. Well, thank you very much. Three cheers for Ikeda Sensei. Hip hip, hooray! Hip hip, hooray! Hip hip, hooray! So this is kind of me. <laughs> 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 Students are worried about uh, poor academic, so they are worried about this. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Alyssa Shaw. I'm the president of the Postgraduate Research Students Association, PASA, here at the ANU. And it is my great pleasure to um, bring a conclusion to this evening's proceedings and to thank Akita Sensei for his wonderful last lecture uh, talk. Um, I really enjoyed the, the humour and um, the generosity of him sharing his experiences here in Australia and at ANU. Um, he's obviously a trailblazer in um, being one of the first or well, the first Japanese student here at ANU. Um, and it's so interesting to hear about Australian history from his perspective, the social changes, um, and of course uh, the era of free education, which I'm sure a lot of the students here would love to see again. 
Um, but also his contributions, of course, to, to Japanese here at ANU um, and with Kabuki in particular. Paso and Russo are very proud to support the last lecture as it marks a really important end to the academic year. And as a student representative, um, I'm given the, the fortunate experience to have done a lot of work with students in uh, the School of Culture, History and Language, CHL, where um, Akita Sensei hails from within the ANU. Um, this school, the research and the teaching uh, that Akita Sensei undertakes typifies one of the most unique and wonderful aspects of ANU, in my opinion, which is our connections and our interest in Asia and the Pacific. So it's a great pleasure to hear about what research, um, what activities are being done uh, within this space and have a greater understanding of how ANU contributes um, and supports academics and students to nurture their interest in connection with Australia's regional neighbours. I should also mention I've um, had the great benefit of being at ANU for my undergraduate years and so I have many friends that went through the Japanese program and were students of Akita Sensei. And so in preparing for tonight, of course, I went and spoke to them about their experiences and they had a lot of wonderful things to say. Um, and so it's, uh, it, it's, I think one of the things that stood out to me the most was um, they spoke about uh, his care for students. So not just in their academic pursuits and successes, but also in their, their welfare. So he has a very holistic understanding of the student and their well-being. Um, and I suppose I've personally benefited from it as well because I went to visit them in Japan. Um, they were so consumed with their love of Japanese culture and language that they went on to live there for some time. And so um, my experience of Japanese culture was also uh, wonderful and uh, thanks in large part to Akita Sensei and his teachings. So on that note, I'd like to um, conclude by reciting the ode to the end the last lecture for 2016. And following this, I welcome you all to join us for refreshments in the lawns just outside. It seems a welcome journey that we look so gratefully to the end of this academic year, but still take the effort to listen to one last lecture. We have no obligation, no monetary or assessment-like intent to be here, but still. We fill this hall not afraid to learn and give. We demonstrate respect for this institution of learning and the values that it brings. Collegiality, commitment, pride, responsibility, freedom, service. Prepare to put those books on their dusty shelves and dismantle the study places, those nooks and cranny-like retreats. Please stand with me now and thank Akita Sensei as he exits this hall and thus ends the 2016 academic year.